and welcome to this Asian Met Shareholders Update. My name is Sasha Sethi and I'm joined by Fuad Salem and we're part of the Investor Relations team at Asia Met. Today we're joined by Asian Met's Executive Chairman, Tony Manini, who will provide an update on the company as well as answer questions sent in by shareholders last week. Tony, welcome to the call. Uh, it's an exciting time for Asian Met for sure. We've received a large number of excellent questions from shareholders ranging from the BKM project Copper Project and the wider KSK license, Bhutong, the copper market, the impact of COVID on the business, and Asia Met's head office relocation from Melbourne to Jakarta. And of course, there's a lot of interest in the Eternum deal. Um, if I could hand over to Fuad now to um, uh, kick off the uh, Q&A session, for that. Sure. Thank you, Sasha. Tony, perhaps to kick off things, um, 2019 was obviously a very busy year for the company which included a number of significant milestones, not least the delivery of the BK and Visibility Study. Could I start by asking you to give our shareholders a brief overview of all these achievements? Thanks, Fuad. Uh, thanks, Sasha. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to, um, following on from the AGM, to give shareholders an update, uh, really just a recap on uh, what we've uh, achieved through not 2019 and you know, what we're looking to do moving forward and into 2020 uh, and beyond. So just to recap, firstly, uh, on 2019, um, in the first quarter of the year, we undertook a, a significant amount of additional drilling uh, on the BKM resource. We, as we progressed through the bankable feasibility study, um, it was recognised that there were additional there was additional material in the lower parts of uh, the pit uh, that um, would have a significant impact in terms of the the life of of the um, of, of the operation as you know proposed in the feasibility study. So we look to drill that that additional uh, resource up and capture that uh, into the model uh, for the mine planning. That also required an, a you know significant amount of additional geotechnical work, and we were required we were, we needed to drill some additional holes for that. Uh, as you go deeper in the pit, obviously you know the pit walls, the stability of the tip, pit walls becomes uh, you know more of an issue. So we're in a we're in an environment here which is you know a, a tropical environment with a you know high rainfall uh, and stability. Uh, of walls uh, in the pits is extremely important. We don't want walls falling in. Um, number one, uh, you know, major safety issues. Uh, number two, sterilizing, you know, um, economic material uh, because you have to move waste. So that geotechnical work was very important. Uh, we, you know, we knew uh, that it was going to delay the release of the feasibility study. We carefully considered that. Um, and felt it was in the best interests of the project over the longer term to capture that additional material into the resource, do that uh, additional geotechnical work such that we had, you know, a robust plan uh, around the mining. So that, that was completed. The, we then moved into Q2, um, pulling all the studies work together uh, into the feasibility study document. And look, you know, that's anybody that's ever been involved in a mining feasibility study or a feasibility study on any significant project will recognise that, you know, compiling documentation from floor to ceiling that can fill up, um, you know, the average person's uh, office uh, is a major undertaking. So all that work was, was done uh, in Q2, people working extremely long hours to pull all that together. Uh, and the outcomes, you know, we were very, very pleased with. So an additional uh, nine-year life uh, to the asset, um, 20 to 25,000 tonnes of copper cathode per annum. That's, uh, in terms of its copper production, you know, it's a good, solid, medium-scale copper project. Uh, we captured around 300,000, a bit over 300,000 tonnes of uh, material into reserve. Uh, from around 404,000 tonnes of contained copper in resource. So, you know, about a 75% uh, conversion uh, of resource 
into reserve, which is, you know, extremely good conversion rate. And you would expect that. We have a, you know, strip ratio here for life of nine of, you know, 1.4, starts off um, sub one and moves, you know, over life of nine to 1.4. So, you know, we have low mining costs uh, in terms of the, the materials movement and, you know, very high conversion of resource to reserve. That then flows on, um, you know, into, um, into uh, an MPV of around $125 million. Um, and that's really the initial MPV before we start to do the value engineering and optimization work on the project. Uh, generates a, 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 an a IRR of 19%. I think importantly, um, the you know the cost structure uh, is extremely competitive here. Um, we we're looking at you know a capital intensity um, of you know somewhere uh, around the seven thousand seven seven to eight thousand dollars per ton uh, of annual capacity. Now that's you know the dollars that need to be spent for each ton of annual production. That's extremely competitive number. Um, we typically, uh, in the industry, the, you know, some of the bigger projects globally, the costs are more like 25,000, 20 to $25,000 per tonne of annual capacity. So, you know, between seven and eight thousand, uh, dollars per tonne is extremely competitive, uh, capital intensity, even though, uh, you know, it's a 200, you know, million dollar, uh, upfront capital spend. So, you know, extremely competitive from that perspective, uh, that flows through into a cost structure, an operating cost structure, um, where our C1 costs are $1.65 a pound and all in sustaining costs at $1.78 a pound. So if you think about, um, you know, the current copper price, uh, we got down to $2.10 recently, uh, a low immediately in the Downdraft, uh, the COVID induced downdraft, we got down to 210. We're currently back to around 70. You know, this project from an OPEX perspective uh, is very robust um, right through that range of pricing scenarios. Uh, as we, as we, as one, of the, one of the key things uh, for the project here is you'll see that we reach peak, peak production at around 25,000 tonnes uh, for around four years, and then the production scale drops away for the subsequent uh, sort of five, four or five year period. So with the upside that we have at the project, we believe that um, the opportunity is very real uh, to convert additional uh, resource to reserve and to, find more material to fill the plant such that we have um, we continue producing at 25,000 tonnes for a life of you know beyond uh, 10 you know and, and potentially 12 years. If we can do that keep the mill full, uh, maximise the unit output from the infrastructure then our cost structure uh, should actually come down uh, from where it is today, even the competitive uh, levels we have today. So look, overall, you know, very, very competitive project. Um, we, we do need to do, you know, some additional drilling um, as the project gets up and running to fill that back end of the plant and to get that sort of mine life out to sort of beyond uh, 10 years and hopefully 12 years. Now I will say to, to you know, shareholders and, and interested parties listening, that there's nothing unusual about you know, the way that we've gone about this. It's very typical for most mines to run a reserve life of around eight to nine years maximum for an open pit operation. And then once you are up and operating, generating cash flow, you are then doing additional work to convert resource to reserve and find additional material to prolong the mine life. And every mine I've ever been involved with uh, works the same way. You'll find that in many gold mines, um, you know, that the, uh, they operate on, you know, a five or six year forward reserve life. So, um, you know, this is a, you know, you know, very robust set of numbers and, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's,
it's a, it's a quality project um, in, in you know, all, all the metrics that we've talked about today. You know, if you sort of, in a simple terms, you know, this has the ability to, you know, generate around, you know, a hundred million dollars US of free cash flow, um, you know, from its operations at full capacity. And, uh, you know, that's a very sort of substantial business uh, in its own right. So uh, very pleased with the outcomes of the feasibility. Um, in the th third quarter, um, you know, post the feasibility study, then we, you know, move, had to move into, um, you know, additional work around, you know, the permitting timelines. I mean, delivering the feasibility study and, uh, you know, we, we publish that for the benefit of shareholders, but, you know, we also have to deliver that feasibility study to the government of Indonesia and the government of Indonesia has to approve that feasibility study in terms of, you know, the work that's been done, the quality of the work, the outcomes, et cetera, um, has to approve and accept that because that then feeds into um, the front end of the permitting process. So in Q3, um, you know, we, we started to push into the longer term um, permitting process uh, <clears throat> to set the project up, you know, for construction. Uh, we also introduced uh, a new, you know, uh, Bruce Shang, uh, one of our large uh, shareholders and, you know, long-term supporter of business. Bruce jo joined the board in Q3. And then as we moved into Q4, um, you know, we commenced discussions uh, with a whole range of uh, parties um, around, you know, partnering on the BKM project uh, with a view to... Um, <coughs> Uh, investing into uh, the project uh, and becoming a partner with us in the sort of future development. And I think, you know, most shareholders have heard me say that this was always been our plan. Our plan was to, um, <clears throat> to take the project through to completion of feasibility in our own right and then introduce a partner to uh, help us with the equity component of the project development. Uh, and, and supporting us um, as we sort of move the project into, through the permitting, into construction and into operation. So, um, you know, a whole range of discussions around that uh, in the fourth quarter. And then ultimately um, that was converted into a turn of energy uh, coming on board as a 19.9%, uh, .9%, you know, significant shareholder in the business. Um, Unfortunately, uh, we were caught in the downdraft of, of uh, the COVID-induced uh, crisis, um, which flowed into the broader economy and, and markets in general. Um, unfortunately, we were caught in that downdraft, but you know, as I've said before, uh, Eternum Energy maintained their commitment uh, to the discussions that we'd had, stepped up, took a placement um, at that time uh, for 19.9%. And then we've continued discussions um, since then. Uh, we have received an offer. We've provided feedback on that offer, and we continue to be fully engaged and negotiate with with the term, uh, with a view to trying to reach an agreement um, that satisfies uh, the best interests of all parties uh, and our, and the Asia Met shareholders. So. Um, you know, very busy year uh, in 2019 uh, into 2020, Fuad. Oh, right, sorry. Now, um, certainly a lot of milestones have been achieved. Um, and running into 2020, which has also been an interesting year for the company, and also for the copper market, I'd like to say, uh, which has seen some of its best quarters, I think, for a long time. I think the market looks quite interestingly balanced at the moment, given the supply disruptions we've seen. And also the global lockdown has focused people's minds on the on, on the environment. And we've seen more and more governments adopting uh, new net zero carbon policies. Could you give us sort of your thoughts on the copper market and how do you see it develop over the next couple of years and perhaps even the longer term? Yeah, look, very, very, very uh, interesting times, uh, to be frank, Fuad. And I, I'm... I'm a student of history, I'm a student of economic cycles, I'm a student of credit cycles and a student of the resources industry, uh, having been in it for 35 years and it consumes my entire life, day and night. Um, so I have a vested interest to you know, understand it deeply in terms of 
you know, the macroeconomic drivers. Um, as you said, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, the COVID, COVID induced sort of downdraft, we saw the price drop down to 210 um, uh, fairly quickly with, you know, where um, I think, you know, people were very concerned as to, you know, what the long-term economic impacts and outlook was going to be. But what is, you know, what's been very interesting is the rebound uh, in uh, the copper price, um, you know, since that over a very short period of time. And seeing we're back at two dollars seventy a pound, uh, you know, uh, now. So, um, and you know, two dollars seventy, uh, you know, is is and, and continuing to strengthen. Now, why why has that happened so quickly? And I think there's there's some primary drivers to that. You know, I've been talking for a number of years about um, the copper market uh, in general. So, you know, it is the world's biggest base metals market. It's 23 million tonnes a year. Uh, so at 23 million tonnes a year, you know, it's, you know, three times the size of sort of the next biggest market being zinc. And, um, you know, that is because it has a whole range of industrial and manufacturing applications, um, particularly in the infrastructure build, in electricity generation, you know, wiring of buildings. Uh, importantly, it's been, a, you know, it's a driver of the infotech revolution. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, one of the fundamental overlays being the growth in renewables, energy and electric vehicles really picking up. So when you sort of think about all of that um, and you have the reaction of governments worldwide pushing a huge amount of money into stimulus programs and what are those stimulus programs, you know, what is the makeup of those stimulus programs, you'll see that a, a large part of the, where that stimulus is being directed is towards uh, infrastructure upgrades uh, and build outs and that's globally you know and we've seen China lead in that area and you know China getting back on course very quickly um, and you know other parts of the world you know putting stimulus programs into place around incentives for renewables particularly renewables and electric electric vehicles so you know that's going to fast forward um, you know really fast forward um, the take up, uh, you know, of renewables and electric vehicles. So that, I think that's a very significant sort of impact um, that we've seen and the copper prices responded. I just want to mention there's one important component um, that most people uh, may not sort of un follow or, or, or appreciate. And that is that on the supply side, uh, and I've, I've been saying this for quite some time, it's very difficult to find new quality copper projects, particularly projects that are development ready. We've been in a period of time where the copper price has been below the incentive price um, for the development of new projects. So very few uh, new copper, develop, copper projects being developed while we've got a big market growing um, progressively sort of over time. So today, if we think of, you know, today, um, you sort of look at the, you know, the economic outlook, uh, the stimulus going into sort of the, re into these sort of key areas for copper demand. On the supply side, we see that the copper inventories worldwide today are half of what they were two years ago. So we only have in inventories, stored inventories globally, around six to seven days of supply for the market. So that tells you that the market is very uh, tight and it's very finely balanced. And we've seen as China's come back online, China consuming 50% of the world's uh, copper, uh, that the prices have started, you know, the market's tightened and the prices have risen accordingly. And we're up to, you know, $2.70 now and continuing to rise. And I think, you know, as, as these infrastructure 
uh, rollouts and as the incentives in renewables and, and EVs take off, um, you know, we're going to see that supply side constraint um, uh, coming through and, you know, the prices uh, being robust over a considerable period of time. Um, and I think any, uh, where I started with this was any student of history will know that when you enter into a period of, you know, economic uh, downturn, recession, uh, and, you know, credit crises, which is, you know, where we are at the moment, there is a period of rebuilding where resources perform extremely well. History will, if you look back in history, you'll see that repeat itself time and time again. So, you know, very confident that we're in a strong period for hard assets uh, and, you know, for, for resources uh, in particular. And, you know, you only got to look at what's happened with the gold price um, just very recently uh, to sort of understand how that plays out over time. So, you know, I think uh, very upbeat uh, on the, on the, you know, on the copper market, Fuad, uh, this last graph that you've put up here, I think, you know, is sort of captures all the things that I've just uh, been through. We have a, in blue is the base demand, you know, going forward. Uh, we have, you know, probable projects in grey. We have possible projects in green. And I can assure you I've been through uh, this list of projects and, those possible projects are, are very unlikely, very unlikely to, to be ever developed. Um, they've been, uh, many of them have been sitting uh, around for many, many years. So, um, and then you've got the trajectory, you know, in the purple line of the demand side, you can see that, um, you know, there's a, a big gap. And I think, you know, the first slide we had up here before, um, there's about a hundred, I think it's $106 billion of new investment needed uh, into the copper market to essentially meet that supply, um, uh, sorry, the demand by 2035. So, you know, $106 billion of new capital and, you know, the lead time for the development of new projects is, is you know, seven to eight years. So, you know, if you sort of put all that in context, Asia Met, um, you know, we're sitting here today with a feasibility study uh, on, a, on a, you know, good solid medium-sized project with good strong underlying economic fundamentals. The copper price is moving up. There's very few of these opportunities globally and we've got a big growth profile sitting behind it. So, you know, the copper, the whole copper market thematic tied to Asia Met's uh, current sort of status and position I think puts us uh, in a really good space. Thanks, Tony. Um, Sasha here again. So just turning back to BKM, uh, we've obviously delivered a, a feasibility study now and demonstrated a viable process route, route and an economically robust project. Uh, we've had a lot of questions on an area which you've just touched upon uh, in your previous summary, which is regarding the value enhancement process and the optimization studies mm -hmm. that we have planned. Um, shareholders will note that we've recently appointed Andrew Neal uh, to lead those studies. Perhaps you could go into a bit of detail there and our, our plans and outline the benefits of this uh, upcoming work program too. Yeah, good question and thanks, thanks, Sasha. And <clears throat> look, you know, shareholders will remember that um, when we put the feasibility study out, um, part of, um, you know, the feasibility study was you know, to, we, we identified a number of areas where we could, you know, believe we could sort of, you know, enhance value in the project. And it's a typical sort of process that, um, you know, all projects go through. There's a value engineering piece that follows uh, most feasibility studies and, you know, work to be done in terms of optimising the overall sort of outcomes of, of uh, the project. So we identified, a, you know, a number of things there. You know, we had our base case NPV, um, you know, of, you know, 120, 125 million. Um, we then, um, you know, had a number of things in terms of the treatment. So we've got different ore types at, um, at BKM. We have uh, different mineralogies and we felt that um, by looking at um, some process technologies, which improved the recoveries of some of those copper from some of those minerals, 
you know, that we, you know, could, there, there was an opportunity there to capture, you know, some significantly more value. And um, I think we sort of flagged around $20 million of additional value. We, 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 we identified the Albion process as part of that, but there's also a couple of other technologies that um, you know we we're going to have a look at to see which sort of fits you know best you know, best fit for purpose. And um, you know, in discussions with Andrew, we've sort of uh, identified um, you know one or two other uh, technologies which you know we believe um, you know may have application here and, and potentially be you know better than the Albion, but look, we'll work all that through. Um, look, there's some technical work in terms of, you know, controlling, you know, in terms of the sequencing. So geological controls flowing into the sequencing, the classification or and the sequencing of ore, um, some opportunities there to capture some value. We're looking at different options in terms of the electricity supply. Um, you know, and every, every ton of material that you don't have to waste uh, is a cost saving. So, you know, looking at, you know, the, the construction earthworks and looking at um, the material movements um, to look at sort of overall reducing costs and optimising uh, that, that area. And then, you know, there, there's sort of a whole, um, you know, there's probably another $15 million there uh, in total opportunity. And then, Really, what from my perspective, one of the biggest value drivers here is, you know, and I've already alluded to this when I talked about filling the mill up. Uh, we had, you know, four or five years of, of full production, but if we can get another five years of full production, then it essentially creates an enormous amount of NPV. And I think, you know, here we've just shown on this uh, little diagram we've got here, you know, probably 75 to $100 million of additional value. But uh, I can assure you that if we can add another four to five years of, you know, full mine life, then, you know, the MPV and the economics of the project are just, you know, they're enhanced very, very significantly. So it is a key area and, you know, we've been looking to get on the ground and do that work for some time. Uh, as you know, shareholders who follow the company closely will know, we it it took us quite a bit of time to get the permit to get on the ground to do the work, and very unfortunately, um, you know, shortly after we've got the permit and the funding in place to do the work, uh, we were we were sort of hit by the COVID lockdown. But um, you know, that's a key area we're looking to you know get into now. Sasha, you mentioned uh, the appointment of Andrew Neal. So, uh, you know, really pleased to be able to get someone of Andrew's calibre, um, uh, you know, into to run this um, value enhancement work. Uh, we've identified beyond the things that are on the slide here, we've actually, you know, in discussions with Andrew, uh, he brings a new set of eyes and, you know, basically 35 years of experience in mineral processing and, you know, mine technical services and et cetera um, to the table. So he's brought some, you know, really good ideas as to other things that we can look at uh, in terms of, you know, value adds, reducing the footprint, um, you know, getting, a, you know, additional revenue sources from some of them, you know, waste materials that we've uh, that will generate as a consequence um, of the mining process so a whole range of different things and uh, we're just working through you know which of those and um, in terms of the stages and targeting uh, of those so putting all that together as we speak just a little bit about Andrew I think it's just worth touching on so as I said he's a mineral process engineer by background Canadian he's had um, you know, big roles as the, you know, head technical services for one of the world's biggest operations, which is the grassberg Erzberg uh, operation of Freeport in Indonesia. Just to put that in perspective, um, it produces somewhere in the order of 2 million ounces of gold a year and around 700, six to 700,000 tonnes of copper a year. So, you know, really very, very large operation. And Andrew was the head of tech services there for a, for a number of years. Um, 
he, I think that's the big end of town, which is fantastic to have that copper uh, experience at the big end of town. But I think importantly, uh, he's also uh, been involved in the development of some smaller projects um, in Central America and South America uh, in both base and precious metals. So he's got experience um, in you know, putting together studies for small companies, putting those things through construction and then getting them up and into operations. So big end of town, small end of town, um, you know, copper minerals processing uh, background, understands the full life cycle, having been a tech services, you know, manager for, for uh, a, a whole range of years, which, you know, covers, you know, everything from, you know, the expiration through studies, through processing, through environmental, water management, the whole spectrum of disciplines that's needed. So very experienced guy, brings a you know, lot of knowledge uh, to the table. I think most importantly, um, or very importantly, Andrew uh, has most recently been employed by Medeca Copper and Gold, big Indonesian copper and gold uh, company. Um, and he has been uh, working on... Um, process improvement uh, at the Merdeka 25,000 tonne per annum SXEW copper cathode heat leach operation. Uh, many, many similarities to, you know, what we're proposing here and what we've completed a feasibility study on for BKM. So he's got that, you know, Indonesian uh, environment, um, climate, um, operation, uh, in copper, in leaching, um, and he brings that to the table, um, you know, for Asia Met in terms of this, this uh, value enhancement and optimization work. So really well placed and we're, you know, very fortunate to have been able to secure someone like Andrew to do that. Uh, the work has kicked off. So we're, we're underway, um, you know, putting together those programs and getting the programs underway. We do need to undertake some drilling as part of that to get some more some more material um, for this test work. Unfortunately, what happens with uh, copper minerals, um, once they're brought to the surface, um, over a period of time, they oxidize and uh, you can't use oxidized materials to do the test work. So we do have to drill a couple of uh, holes to get some more sample so that we've got fresh material as it would be when it comes out of the ground when you're mining uh, to undertake this sort of work. Uh, obviously, with COVID, the, the COVID um, restrictions on travel that makes things difficult. But you know, we you know we've got to follow the guidelines uh, that the gov Indonesian government has provided us with, and you know, the safety and security of our people is always sort of the most important thing. But we're looking at um, you know things are gradually opening up, and we're looking at ways that we can fast track you know, getting a couple of rigs on the ground to, to get that sample material um, and get that additional sort of test work underway. In the meantime, you know, there's a lot of work to be done on those other aspects, on the electricity supply, logistics routes, um, uh, you know, earthworks, uh, you know, and, you know, scheduling and optimization, et cetera, et cetera. So Andrew's sort of uh, got the bit between his teeth and, you uh, if uh, we're uh, we're underway with all that work. Oh, no, thanks. That uh, sounds very exciting, and presumably quite a lot of news flow coming through um, on the BKM, um, so on the on the um, value enhancement studies uh, currently underway. Then with Andrew leading leading that team. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, you know that's that it's that's a that's a critical part of. Uh, you know, the, the work that we need to do, and that'll happen throughout over the next, uh, the remainder of this year, uh, all of that work's being undertaken, you know, while, you know, we continue with our, all our permitting work uh, and, um, you know, with the, the work with the Turnham in terms of partnering and the plans to take the project forward. Andrew will get on with all this technical work and get that work done and have the, you know, the, all those revisions completed um, you know, by the end of this year with a view to being in a strong position then to take the project uh, directly into um, a project financing, you know, a debt financing. Sure, sure. 
Now, Tony, um, I'd like to turn to some of the other questions we've received from shareholders on BTM and, of course, um, Eternum Energy. Eternum Energy, as you, you've rightly said, has become a large cornerstone investor in the company with a holding of 19.9% in the business. Tony, you've been in extensive discussions with Eternum uh, for a little while now on a, with respect to sort of a much larger transaction. What are the metrics you use to derive to an acceptable value? And what does a good deal look like in your mind? Um, okay, so let's start with um, what does a good deal look like? It's probably the best, uh, is the best way to start. So, I mean, the best, the most important thing that we need as a company to achieve out of any uh, deal um, is to secure a development path for the project. So, you know, that it means, you know, a funding path uh, and it means having a supportive shareholder to actually help you um, through that path, through the regulatory processes, through the various pieces of the funding pie. So there's not just an equity component here, there's also a debt component. And, you know, an ideal partner for us is somebody that firstly comes into, uh, comes into the project and contributes to the equity component uh, of the project, uh, enables us to self-fund, well, to continue to fund uh, all this ongoing uh, work that we're currently doing pre-construction, uh, including the, the permitting, um, without us, you know, having to come back to the market, uh, you know, for additional funding. That's, uh, you know, it's a critically important part of, of any deal. And then having the credibility, um, the sort of background experience, if you like, in terms of relationships with various banks uh, and other you know, funding parties, whether they're, you know, commodities uh, trading houses um, for offtake, et cetera, that actually help you secure, um, you know, the debt component that you need uh, for the project. So you've got the equity piece, you've got the debt piece, you've got a supportive partner to, that's going to help you with the, you know, all the permitting that needs to be put in place. Um, and then you've got the financial capacity, you know, to take the project right through to construction, uh, production and, and operations, um, you know, without having to, con you know, continue to tap the market. So, um, you know, they're the critical things that, 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 you know, we need to see in a deal. So it's a long-term partnership that covers sort of all of those key areas. Um, that's what a good deal, what a deal looks like. Um, I think that's, you know, if, if we can achieve that, that's in, in the best interests of all shareholders. Um, in terms of how we look at the metrics, um, you know, look, there's a whole range of ways that you value, you know, you value projects. So the MPV, which we've just talked about today, is one of those. You know, there's the upside that we've talked about and the value enhancement opportunities and, you know, a percentage of those. There's market comparables. Um, you know, what are the trading comps for, you know, companies of our side? Um, you know, what are the transaction comps? You know, you know companies are being, there's M&A activity in the copper space. So, you know, what valuations are being achieved um, in terms of, you know, both projects and companies in M&A? Um, you know, there's comps related around um, resource tons and grade. Um, at various stages of development. So there's a whole range of different sort of valuation metrics that actually the way that things get valued is that you, you look at all of those. So that might be five or six different methodologies um, and then you sort of get a range, um, you know, that makes, uh, you know, sort of an optimum range or, or a best midpoint range for, for all those different metrics. And, that's the way we think about the metrics of value. Um, and that's sort of the way that we're approaching that for um, our discussions with the Turnham. You know, the, the market's the market and the market, you know, uh, you know, there's a see-through value from a market perspective, but 
Um, that's just only one metric of probably half a dozen that you know we look at, and um, you know, in our discussions, sort of are, are referring to. So um, you know, that's and that's that's a pretty normal normal process. Okay, and in terms of a time frame uh, to conclude such a transaction, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Do you envisage a transaction in the next couple of weeks or months, or could you give us some guidance? Oh, look at. <laughs> Look, it's it's always very difficult to to put timeframes on on a transaction, and you know I I you know I've seen shareholders getting um, what's the right word um, uh, you know frustrated or expressing frustration that things are taking a long time, which is just you know in my mind is um, it's just not the way that you know it's just lack of understanding of how you know, business processes work. So, um, you know, typically, you know, an M&A transaction of this type, um, you would expect to take, you know, many months. We've already been working with a turnum for a few months, uh, for a couple, couple of months, and, you know, I expect that we'll be working with them, you know, for a few more months. Exactly how long, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, we could reach agreement and, and 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 nail all the things um, pretty quickly and, and and get it wrapped up. But you know, if we if we're going to get an outcome that's in the best interest of shareholders, it's best that we you know um, negotiate um, you know sensible terms which meet the criteria that I just talked about. So I mean, if you think about all those bits and pieces that I just talked about that we need to see in terms of a deal structure, there's you know there's quite a lot of complexity around all of that and how they tie together. So it does take time, um, and you know this. So there's a lot of negotiation, sort of you know backwards and forwards in respect of that. You know what I did say, you know, and where people I think uh, mistook what I said. I said that we were expecting an offer, um, and we received an offer uh, within you know pretty close to the time frame that. I was expected in terms of completion of a deal you know I've just covered off on that um, you know we, we push we push as hard as we can uh, to you know to get um, the best outcome we can for our shareholders but also you know to secure the long-term future um, funding future and uh, development future for the project and that's really where you know my focus and the focus of you know our team team is at the moment um, and you know we're supported by uh, you know our M&A advisory group at uh, Grant Samuel um, and you know they they're working alongside us um, you know working through all these different aspects and you know once you agree you know the terms and the structure then you've got to put it all into a legal framework um, which you know which governs you know how this sort of uh, all, all works going forward so um, you know, quite a lot of work to, to be done. Uh, you know, there is, it's an intense period of time and, um, but you know, everything's going, you know, going pretty well at the moment. Okay. And um, just in case of a, of a no deal, let's hope it's not going to happen, but just in case, do you think that the turnover will remain a supportive shareholder in the business? Um, well, <laughs> I don't think, none of us have contemplated the turn of not being a supportive shareholder of the company. Uh, that's for sure. And look, you know, I mean, the objective of the parties really is to um, is to reach an agreement whereby they're a supportive shareholder, and we know we've got a project level deal. So that's the core focus at the moment. Um, you know, if ever, if ever, if ever, if ever there comes a, a time where we have to consider it a different way, then we'll do that when we get to it. But um, it's certainly not something that's um, you know, it's that's preoccupying uh, my sort of time at the moment. We've, um, you know, we're working. As I said, we're fully engaged and you know working closely with them to you know to reach an agreement um, whereby they, you know, remain a shareholder and um, there's a deal done at the project level. Indeed, yes. Okay, um, moving on. There's a question here with regards to the recent placings and the limited operational activity on the BTM project. Um, naturally, the company has been impacted by COVID and had to postpone drilling uh, programs, exploration efforts, as you just mentioned, Tony. But now that Western economies are starting to open up again, could you perhaps give us 
a bit of uh, your, your thoughts on how things are developing in Indonesia and when you think the company will be in a position to recommence operations. Yeah, okay, look, look. firstly, I'd say that we've never stopped operations. So, um, uh, you know, just the activities that we've been able to sort of undertake have been, uh, you know, a little restricted, but not, not, not restricted in a big way. Um, and, you know, we, we're, I guess we've been fortunate in some ways, that, um, fortunate and unfortunate. So we were slowed down, you know, by the permitting for the drilling. Um, and, you know, we, we were about to get back on the ground when, uh, when COVID hit. So obviously that's impacts upon us. Um, as I said earlier, you know, the safety of our people, safety, security, health is, you know, the most important thing. The government has an overlay in terms of restrictions. Where is Indonesia in respect to all of this? I mean, I think Indonesia is not too indifferent to, you know, um, you mentioned the Western, Western economies. And Indonesia's got a large number of cases each day. Um, but, you know, it's in the context of a 250 million population. So... Um, you know, the countries, the numbers, you know, are not going up. Um, they seem to be fairly consistent. Um, they still obviously have a pretty, you know, significant issue. But for example, um, you know, we are seeing some travel open up. So there's the ability to travel um, between provinces um, and, you know, restricted movements, you know, for people who are going to the offices. So, so during this period, you know, we, I think up to this point, you know, it's fair to say we really haven't been significantly impacted um, other than, you know, we've been constrained from getting on and doing some of the drilling work we wanted to do. But we've really pushed ahead with the permitting side. Um, you know, the government's... And one of the, one of the positive flow-ons, you know, from when you have a crisis like this is that everybody wants to get the economy up and going again. So there's a real focus on, you know, fast tracking, you know, various components of your permitting and people are, you know, looking to get behind you to help sort of push things forward um, quicker than maybe they otherwise, you know, would have done. So, um, and, you know, we've got the governor's recommendation letter, as we talked about recently, um, we've got had work going on and people sort of ask, well, what work has been going on? You know, we've got the, you know, the AMDAL going on, the, the environmental impact assessment. You know, there's, um, uh, you know, there's been surveys related to that. We've got data, assay data coming in. There's um, water monitoring data, baseline information flowing through. Um, so, and, and there's a whole range of um things that, when I say things, are pieces of information that the government requires as part of permitting process. So it's not like, okay, you just, you know, you, you turn up and you say, uh, yeah, yeah, we've done this and you get a permit. I mean, you know, the government says, okay, well, can we have a look at the work that you've done? There's a gap here. Um, you know, how do you propose to fill that gap? So, you know, there's, there's ongoing iterations of work and things that we need to feed into government. Um, you know, across all the different uh, aspects. So environmental, which covers, you know, your your water, your flora, your fauna, um, and and all the things that sort of impact upon um, the water, you know, your, 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 your acid balance and acid generating capacity and your waste neutralization and your waste acid generating capacity. So there's a whole range of, of complex sort of interactions, you know, uh, on the environmental side uh, in terms of, you know, that permit. Um, and that sort of flows through, obviously, into the forestry permit. And, you know, with a forestry permit, we've got to negotiate with other forestry forest users, you know, for single single um, route access. How are we going to interact with those other forest users? You know, um, you know agreements around that. The government sort of wants you to work with with those parties to get uh, agreements for each of those different um, land use aspects. So you know, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes work which goes into you know to the to the permitting process. All of that has continued through um, because it's predominantly desktop related work, mm -hmm. and we've done the field work that fed 
the information in. So the assay information, all that information coming in, it was a matter of then, you know, compiling and then getting that into the government. Now with Andrew on board, uh, you know, we're ramping up the sort of, you know, project engineering, uh, value engineering and optimization work. As I said, we need to get a couple of drill holes drilled. Uh, there's a lot of desktop work still, you know, to be done there. So look, you know, we've been held up to some degree, but you know, we've, we've been able to, we've been in a period of time where there's a lot of work to be done around those key work streams of permitting um, and, you know, whether it's the Amdal and the forestry permit recommendations, et cetera, where a lot of that's been desktop work. So we've been fortunate we've been able to push all that forward during these sort of this period of time. Things are now progressively starting to open up. We've got Andrew on board, you know, for for those work streams in terms of the, the um, value enhancement optimization and, uh, you know, all of that sort of getting a bit of momentum. So, you know, I think um, while there has been challenges, um, you know, we're in a pretty good space. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, I think this leads naturally to a few questions we've had on the, um, on the Pinjam Pakai or the Forestry Borrow to Use Permit. You've touched yeah. upon quite a bit of the work that's going on in the background and obviously you can explain that we haven't been standing still. But could you please go into maybe explain the importance of this next permit and where it sits in the, in the overall permitting stage of the project and um, the order of, uh, you know, some of, the, some, of the, some of the work that's left over there and how, how progressed we are? Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks, Sasha. I mean, I think, I think if you ask anybody that's ever built a mine in Indonesia or is involved in the mining industry in Indonesia, they'll tell you that Pinjam Pakai is the single biggest uh, and most important um, permit that you need to get. So that's the context. It is a, it, it is a very important permit. Uh, it's it, it, there's a lot of complexity as I've already referred to around the interfaces and the various sub permits that feed into that permit um, and you know it's a constant day and night job for a number of people uh, all of our team in you know pulling together this information feeding it in um, revising you know, various components as required. So there's a lot of sort of interaction with the government. We, there's three key approvals. Um, there's a lot of sub approvals, but there's three key ones. So the government's recommendation, which is, uh, you know, we're very pleased to get the, that's the, the, the governor of central Kalimantan. So to get his recommendation or stick, you know, or, or stamp of approval for, um, you know, the company and the project. So we have that. As I already mentioned, we're working with the other forestry concession holders now, you know, that we sort of cross over um, in terms of their land use. And that's not just the project site itself, but it's the transport route between the site um, and the port. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a you know, pretty significant, you know, area that needs to be covered. And we have to get permits in place with all of those different users of, of um, the infrastructure and the land. And then the third one, and I've referred to this already, is the AMDA or the environmental um, uh, the environmental permit. And you know, this we're updating that. You know, as you you know, as you modify different parts of the feasibility, things that are in the feasibility plan. So, you know, we've got, you know, some as shareholders would have seen, you know, there's been some new bridges built and new roads built and, you know, various other infrastructure is changing all the time. Now, as you change, you know, modify, you know, the plans in terms of your feasibility study, you actually are required to uh, go back to the government and modify your AMDEL accordingly for, to, to do that. So you might ask, well, why don't you just stick to one plan and do that and so on and so forth. But, the reality is, you know, um, are you going to drive down, you know, um, a dirt road when there's a brand new um, bitumen road uh, and, you know, cross on barges when there's a new bridge built? So the reality is you, you know, of course you're going to do those things and, 
while it seems simple to us that, um, yeah, okay, we'll just get on the road and, and drive, but, you know, we've got large pieces of equipment, you know, they weigh a certain amount, you know, do they, you know, how do they impact upon the infrastructure? How do they impact upon the people who live along the road route? Um, noise, dust, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's a lot of flow and effects, um, you know, from you know, those changes and we need to address those um, and we need to address them properly to satisfy the government um, in order to get the permits. Look, we're that said, you know, as I said, during this COVID time, this is all desktop work. We've got a team, you know, half a dozen people working full time on this all the time. Um, some people might ask us, what do we do? <laughs> you know, what are we doing? You know, there's a lot going on. You know, there's a lot of people working extremely hard uh, in all of these areas. Um, so, you know, we're progressing well on all fronts. We're, you know, we're, we're on schedule, on time, and we need to sort of get all this in and, with a view to, you know, essentially by the end of this year, um, achieving that key that key permit. And once we've got that permit, we then have other permits. All mines have other permits. You've got construction permits and you've got, you know, permits to place tailings and, you know, various other things. But this is the single biggest key permit, uh, you know, to develop any project um, in Indonesia. Well, now, Tony, turn to, uh, to Bhutan then, the other uh, key asset in our portfolio, which obviously hosts a world-class copper gold porphyry system. I mean, it's well understood that it's quite expensive to develop these, these assets, the very few around. But would you consider using some of the proceeds of, of a possible sale of the BKM project to develop Bhutan, or would you rather prefer to develop it alongside a credible development partner? Yeah, look, um, yeah, good question. And, you know, I've been asked this question a number of times. I think it's a little hard to be definitive about which way you would go. Um, if, if you ask me what is my preference, um, my preference is, uh, you know, to bring in a deep-pocketed joint venture partner to, you know, take the project uh, through, I mean, this project's had 33,000 metres of drilling on it. It's got a job compliant resource, measured indicated resources. Um, you know, it's, it, it's had, a, you know, Indonesian level, um, you know, study, feasibility study done on it, which, you know, is, is probably more like a conceptual level study um, in terms of a bankable study. Uh, so, you know, quite a lot of work being done, you know, some mine, you know, mine planning and, um, you know, water management and, you know, all at a pretty high level. Um, to take this project through full feasibility study, you know, it's going to need, it, it's going to, realistically, this is a big project um, and it's going to need probably somewhere around 25 to $30 million. Um, and that's without any further drilling. So, you know, it's a very substantial amount of money. And if you think about, you know, uh, Asia Met, um, you know, as mighty as the mouse is, uh, you know, I think we've probably raised a grand total of um, uh, half of that money uh, over the past five years. So um, reality is big project, um, you know, fantastic project, uh, and it's going to have its day in the sun. Um, but, you know, the best thing that we can do is, um, you know, focus on getting into production and bringing in somebody with the deep pockets, with the expertise in developing big projects, um, and to get this, you know, to get this, to get the feasibility work done, to get it all permitted and get it into production. And if we can retain, you know, a good interest in that, um, and people will probably ask me what's a good interest, um, you know, ultimately I'd like to sort of hold, you know, if we can maintain a 30% interest in this project, uh, 30 to 40 uh, project of this scale. What we may do, Fuad, just to sort of round that out a little bit is that, you know, we may ultimately use some of the proceeds of any other deals um, to maintain our interest in the project, right? So, you know, the way that these joint, a joint venture for development on this would typically work is that, you know, the partner would fund it through to a certain point. After that point, you know, we would be asked to contribute to our share of the funding 
for the ongoing development or alternatively dilute our interest further, um, you know, based on an agreed mechanism in terms of the expenditure versus uh, reduction in, in your ownership interest. So, look, all of those things are sort of on, you know, on the table. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get up there and I'd love to drill um, half a dozen holes into the, you know, big magnetic target that we've got underneath, you know, I mean, you know, I'm very sort of excited. I'm very excited by that. You know, it's a it's a classical signature uh, of you know world class uh, copper gold deposits, and you know, Sol Gold's project. You know, Cascabel um, has this signature. You know, probably even better project is Wafi Gold Poo in um, up in uh, you know Papua New Guinea that Newcrest uh, owns. Um, this has you know this project has the almost the identical signatures in terms of alteration, mineralization, magnetic features. Um, but it needs, you know, look, if you, if you go and look at the history of, um, you know, Wafi, Newcrest's interest in Wafi, you know, they've drilled, you know, 40 or 50, two and a half thousand metre holes. And, you know, two and a half thousand metre hole at $300 a metre, um, you can do the maths yourself, the $750,000 a hole. So, you know, um, you know, that's, you know, while we'd love to drill, you know, five or six holes into that, um, the reality is that, um, you know, we just don't have the f financial capacity to do that. So um, it's really a project, um, I think, that makes the most sense for shareholders to, to introduce a development partner to both you know, take it through feasibility and, and to test the depth extensions and, you know, for us to maintain a meaningful stake uh, in that ongoing development. Sure. Um, and just on that, the, on that development partner, could you perhaps give us a bit more colour on how your discussions with, with potential development partners are proceeding um, on this asset at the moment? Yeah, look, look, we've had a lot of interest. I mean, boot, you would expect to have a lot of interest in a project like this. I mean, you know, just just go and look at projects around the world, you know, that are available or that, that are sort of at this stage, which are 60 kilometres from the coast, you know, where you've got a port, you've got all the infrastructure in place, um, you've got roads and... You know, it's a stone's throw from the main consuming market globally. So, you know, you would you would expect we'd have some su substantial interest, and we have had. Um, you know, we we and, and and quite a bit of that interest has been very recent. Um, and in fact, we've had some interest during this sort of COVID period as well. But um, you know, the reality is that at the moment, no one, you know, we can't get to the site. You know, um, site visits can't be done. Um, so, you know, we're taking that interest on board. In fact, you know, I've got calls scheduled with a couple of parties, um, over the next few days, um, to just talk them through, walk them through the project, you know, what it is and where we're at and, you know, the things that sort of we'd like to sort of, the way that we'd like to sort of take it forward, if you like. So, um, you know, plenty of interest. Um, as I said, it will have its day in the sun. Um, and for us, you know, <clears throat> a project like this of this scale in this location, and there's a whole range of, you know, particular skill sets that you need. So you not, not only need the technical skills, you also need, you know, the skills to manage the, you know, the, the environment that you're in and also, you know, the communities and the interfaces with, uh, the, the government, uh, both locally uh, and in Indonesia. So, you know, some some groups are, are better equipped to do that than others. Um, but without that, the project won't succeed. So, you know, we've got to be particular about who we bring in. They've got to have the financial capacity, the technical capacity, and the operating, in-country operating capacity to be successful. And um, so we'll assess, you know, assess each of the groups uh, on, on that basis. And, um, you know, fingers crossed, um, you know, we, we are able to secure that. But look, it's going to take a bit of time, a little bit of time because, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, it's going to require site visits. We have had 
Um, you know, some parties already complete site visits, uh, but we've got others who haven't yet completed site visits and who wish to do so. So, um, you know, we'll continue to progress all that, that forward um, and, you know, look to, you know, I can't, again, it's very difficult for me to put a time frame on it, but um, the sooner the better, but um, the sooner the better, um, you know, has, a, has quite a few moving parts um, given, you know, the state of uh, flux in, in, um, in the world, both from um, an economic and a health perspective. Thanks, Tony. Um, okay, we've covered quite a lot of the questions we received on BKM, Aternum, Bhutan. Um, I think hopefully we've covered most. Um, and, you know, please let us know if uh, there's anything else you'd like to find out. Um, but to turn to some more corporate matters uh, that we've been asked about, um, we've been asked a few questions about um, our cash burn and um, savings plan. But Tony, I know you've introduced a significant cost saving plan already this year. So perhaps you could expand on that little bit and, and the current um, burn for the company. Yeah, look, um, I guess I sort of, you know, we've covered all the context, I think, think today in terms of, you know, what we've been able to do and what we've not been able to do. And I think, you know, shareholders are aware that, you know, now that the feasibility study is complete and the centre of gravity, you know, is moving to Jakarta and, you know, Andrew Neal has been, you know, hired out of out of Jakarta and, you know, all our permitting teams in Jakarta, um, that the centre of gravity sort of moves from, you know, being Melbourne based where the feasibility study was run to uh, up to Jakarta and uh, hence the move of the corporate office. So, you know, there's a, there's a significant sort of cost saving in that. Um, uh, you know, people will be aware that at the moment, um, uh, you know, we're in the progress, you know, process of moving, but that's one area that has been impacted, um, to be quite frank, is, is our ability to sort of execute on all of that because uh, number one is sort of, um, you know, we haven't been able to go to the office, access the office in Melbourne. As a consequence of not being able to access the office, we haven't been able to sublet the, 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 the space. So there's some flow-ons related to that. Um, you know, Peter Bird, uh, who was the CEO, left the business um, in uh, February. And, you know, we haven't replaced Peter to date. You know, I've been filling an executive capacity uh, over the past, you know, five months or so and supported by James Dio, the CFO. Um, we have been slowed down in terms of sort of, you know, the recruitment of a new CFO and CEO based in Jakarta um, and the move, you know, moving the headquarters up there. So that has been impacted to some degree by COVID. But look, we've been line by line through every single item in our cost structure and essentially, um, you know, all our suppliers, uh, all our sort of any non-essential activity, every different area of the business we've been through um, and, you know, the office vehicle has, you know, we don't have an office vehicle. We, you know, are, are hiring, you know, taxis and, you know, so every line item has been looked at to reduce the, the cost as much as we possibly can. Um, and, uh, you know, we've made, you know, James has done a great job uh, on all of that. Um, look, we've always maintained a discipline approach, I mean, to, to all of those things. And I think shareholders have only got to look at the, the board of directors, um, you know, and the way they approach the business. I mean, we haven't had a director pay the cash payment, I think, for, for I can't remember how long. Um, you know, everybody's, you know, is prepared to take equity. Um, they're very modest fees. Um, and at the same time, you know, those directors have contributed to, you know, the capital um, raisings for the company. So, you know, I think we're, you know, we're, we're certainly, you know, as efficient as we possibly can be. We'll consolidate into a single office um, and, you know, the team will be all Jakarta based. Um, so uh, I'm, you know, pretty happy that, um, you know, we've got that as tight as it possibly can be. That said, you know, there's a cost in running a publicly listed company and there's a cost of operating a business. You know, I've talked about all the activities we've done today. Well, you don't do, you know, you can't undertake that level of, 
that level of activity on fresh air. So, um, you know, we've got, a, you know, we've got a you know, number of senior staff um, that sort of drive, drive all of that. We've got office, you know, we've got an office um, that we, you know, we maintain and then, you know, to service that office, you know, with utilities and IT infrastructure and, you know, various things like that. In fact, we've put off upgrading our IT and, you know, our IT and accounting systems, um, you know, as part of the cost savings that we've sort of undertaken. So, um, and, you know, the, then, then you've just, you know, you've got, you know, activities in terms of, you know, the permitting work that I referred to, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, significant amount of cost involved in um, consultants, utilising consultants for environmental work, environmental reporting, um, you know, assay test work, um, all of the things that go into, you know, the AMDEL, the permitting lawyers, uh, in terms of, you know, agreements related to forest use. So, you know, there's a high level of activity, um, but we've got a very, you know, minimalist approach to, we try to minimise cost as much as we possibly can. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we, you know, on top of that, and I think a lot of people probably maybe don't appreciate that um, when you have mining projects in any country, uh, you have to pay rent on the land that you hold. So, you know, we've got rents to pay um, and each year that goes by, those rents, um, you know, escalate. Um, so, you know, we it, it, it costs us, you know, somewhere to sort of run the business without um, drilling and doing all that work. You know, we, our burn rate is probably around a couple of million dollars a year. Okay, thanks, Tony. So you're guarding every penny um, pretty closely there. Um, oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's like you know, it's um, <laughs> some, it uh, you know, as I said, every single line item has been looked at, and um, you know, we 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 are guarding every penny. Uh, we've always been like that. I mean, you know, when Steve Hughes was there, and you know, Sasha, you know, our costs of drilling per meter. I um, mean. People just don't actually believe you when you tell them that you drill for the cost that we drilled there. Um, you know, people are paying two to three hundred dollars a meter, and we were paying, you know, thirty dollars at the low end and maximum sort of seventy to eighty dollars for deeper holes. You know, so we're getting a lot of bang for our buck. We've always got a lot, a lot of bang for our buck. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're a public company. You know, there's a there's a significant cost to 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 you know operate a business, but you know we're doing that as as um, as uh, lean as we possibly can. Thanks, Tony. Um, I don't want to repeat anything, uh, so maybe just touch upon it briefly. Though I, I have had specific questions on the process of relocating to Indonesia, but I think we pretty much covered that. Um, but what specifically we've been asked about is, um, you know, the process now with appointment of uh, CEO and, uh, and CFO roles going forward and um, yep. the yep. strategy and, yep. and, and where we are with that. Yeah, okay. So look, I'll just update on that really. I think that's the simplest way. Um, so I'll start with the CFO role first. So the CFO role, um, We've been through, you know, we, 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 we had a recruitment agency. Um, they went out, we got a, um, you know, a dozen or so candidates. Uh, James filtered that down, um, you know, basically from a technical perspective. So who had the technical skills, um, but not just the technical, but the technical skills, the regulatory, you know, the interface with the regulatory environment and really, um, the skills that are required in a public company from, you know, from an accounting and a regulatory perspective. So, um, and, and, the, and by the way, you know, we, we, you know, we, this, this is, uh, was open to both um, uh, uh, nationals and expatriate staff. Um, we, we whittled that down to essentially a short list of two. Um, they were both of those uh, were interviewed by James and I have been through an interview process um, myself with both of the candidates um, over the past week. Uh, in fact, I, 
this week, as of today's Thursday, as of Tuesday, was the second candidate that I that I uh, interviewed. Both extremely high caliber uh, individuals, and uh, we just now need to um, sit down, compare notes, and uh, make a decision on uh, which one of those two candidates um, we'll be making an offer to. So the CFO um, process is complete and, you know, we've got some fantastic, both both terrific candidates um, and, you know, uh, either one of them will do a, you know, you know will, will be, do a sensational job for the company, I've got no doubt. Um, on the CEO, uh, again, we had a recruitment agency, we got it down to, a short list of four candidates. Um, and we've just kept it at that at the moment, Sasha. Um, given the context that we're sort of in, in negotiations with the Turnham, um, we've got Andrew starting in terms of, you know, project managing all the technical work. We've got Jaja looking after all the external relations work and the permitting and James supporting me uh, and looking after the, you know, the financial side, um, then we, you know, we're, we're, we're managing uh, all of that at the moment. Um, the, in terms of a CEO role, um, we feel it's very important for any CEO um, to meet face to face with all our senior staff, um, including myself. Um, so, you know, while we could do that over over the um, over over the uh, over Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever it may be, whatever platform that, that you use, um, we you know we are um, we feel that you know a face to face meeting, um, a visit to the site, I think for the CEO is quite important. They need to understand the project well, the environment that they've got to manage the people they've got to manage the interfaces. So it's, it tends to be, you know, more complex, I think, in terms of, you know, the individual that we're looking for. Um, there's not only the Indonesian end, of course, there's, you know, the, the PR side, the IR side, um, you know, the markets facing piece, which is, you know, critically important as well. So, um, you know, we're cross jurisdictions, we've got um, the UK and we've got Indonesia, um, we've got technical, we've got, Community, we've got government, uh, operating site. So far, you know, it's it's quite significantly more complex. But you know, we've got four good candidates there. But um, you know, all of those candidates themselves want to visit. You know, want to visit Indonesia, want to go there, meet the staff, want to visit the site. So that's just not possible at the moment. But you know, as soon as it is, um, we'll push forward with that, and uh, I'm sure um, you know we'll get. Um, you know, we'll get a good candidate. Um, you know, just that like, you know, just like, you know, like the CFO role, um, you know, we've attracted some, you know, really high quality, uh, you know, high caliber people have been attracted to, um, you know, to to us, which is a credit to, um, you know, to the, to the company, all the people who work in it. Um, and, you know, our projects, it's a, just a good reflection uh, on the business that you got, you know, really, top quality people wanting to come and work for you. And I can assure you they're working for some pretty substantial companies right now. So, you know, one of the key questions I asked them is, you know, why would you leave that job to come to work for Asia Met? And um, it's quite interesting the answers that you do, you do get to that. Um, and a lot of that's around the credibility of the people that are involved, um, track record, background. Um, and, you know, one of the other key pieces that, that, that I'm happy to talk about is that um, we have a very, very strong reputation for our governance, compliance, uh, you know, our policy, strong policies, procedures, and most importantly, uh, and this is a, you know, credit to Mansour and the team, is our credentials with the local community and the management of the local environment. Um, we are seen and we're known uh, in Indonesia for those credentials. Um, and, you know, we've won a number of awards as a business for, for, our, for our community uh, development project programs or the one, those that we support. So, you know, that's a real, um, 
you know, I think that's, you know, they're, they're things that people don't often uh, recognise, but uh, incredibly important. And, you know, we're in a new era. You know, you've got um, Indonesia's developing country, but you've got a new generation of younger professionals coming through who are looking at all these various aspects of, of a business. You know, they want, um, they want to see good governance. They want to see, uh, you know, you know, good, good compliance and assurance systems, and they want to see good, you know, environmental and community management. So, um, you know, I'm really pleased in having those interviews and discussions with people that we've been recognised for that, which is great. Okay, uh, Tony, that's very, very exciting um, to hear about, to hear. Um, thanks for the update. I think we've covered most of the topics now. Um, we're halfway through 2020, and as a final question, can I ask you to give a bit more insight as to what shareholders can expect uh, for the remainder of this year and perhaps early into next year? Yeah, okay. I think that's a good, good, uh, probably good, good point to wrap it up. Uh, thanks for it. Yeah, look, I'm, and I've covered a lot of this as we've sort of gone through, but just to summarise, if you like. So, um, you know, getting the value engineering piece up and running um, you know, really important in terms of you know the preparing the project, uh, preparing the the, the project for uh, for the financing. Um, so that will be you know really important. A number of work streams there, uh, and some of those with the potential to really significantly impact and and improve the economics on the project. So really important piece of work leading into uh, a project financing. Um, I've already talked about the, you know, the Pinch and Puck Eye and the importance of that permit. And, you know, there's a lot, still a lot of work to be done there over the next six months. And, you know, the teams, as I said, working 24 seven on that. Um, so, you know, a, a lot happening there. Um, and, you know, some important milestones to be knocked over along the way. And then of course, you know, there's, you know, we're, we're, you know, in deep in negotiations with the Turnham Energy, which, uh, you know, is a company, you know, will be a company changing transaction, um, you know, on the proviso that, you know, we can reach agreement that, um, you know, satisfactory to all parties because, you know, it'll sort of see the, the company um, with a funding path, um, you know, going into, into the financing um, and, you know, being able to push ahead into the sort of construction and development as they come through. So really, really, you know, I mean, Despite the restrictions we've got around COVID, um, you know, we do want to get on the ground and do some, you know, some drilling as well, um, you know, within the confines of the, the resources that we have available to us. Um, so, look, you know, all of that will translates into really strong news flow, I think, over the next, you know, we're coming into a period where there's a lot of activity, uh, you know, we'll push all that out into the public domain. Um, you know, as as each piece is knocked over, so you know we can expect you know good strong news flow and um, you know really active sort of second half um, as we sort of come out of the sort of COVID lockdown and despite despite it, um, yeah, and it's really exciting you know time for the company. Some major you know some major company transforming things happening right now, and um, you know I'm looking forward to. Uh, an exciting six months and reporting uh, all that through. And then obviously that flows through into a project financing and pressing buttons to, you know, um, start to, you know, get all the things in place to construct the project and, you know, take it through through and into the construction phase. So, um, you know, critical, critical time. Um, and then, you know, we've got, uh, you know, as, I, as I've already alluded to, you know, a fair bit of work happening around the, the partnering aspect on Bhutan as well. And, you know, that'll take a little bit of time, but I'm looking forward to, um, you know, some positive outcomes to that over the next few months uh, as well. So, um, yeah, exciting times. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, while it's a sort of a, a strange environment that we've sort of been in, in the past few months, um, you know, we have been able to maintain momentum and that has set us up for, you know, for the next six months. So um, uh, looking forward to it and looking forward to reporting uh, on all of that to shareholders um, as we work through it. Very good. Thanks, Tony. Look, 
lots of detail there. Um, and as I said, I hope we have answered all the questions that we've submitted. Um, and um, obviously, there are, we are, we're contactable at any time. So all our phone numbers and email addresses are at the bottom of the RNSs and on the website. Um, so yeah, please do get in touch if you missed anything. And I you know, look forward to um, uh, continuing to progress uh, on BKM and in other regards as well. So I guess, unless there's any last, last words, should we wrap it up there, guys? Um, yeah, I think that's covered it all, Sasha. I just want to say, um, <clears throat> Uh, on behalf of the the board and management, I just want to thank the shareholders for their support over the course of um, the last year, and you know, for some of the long term supporters, been you know considerably longer than that. So, um, you know, has it's it's never easy the life cycle of a uh, of a you know junior um, in the resources space, but. Um, you know, we're very grateful and appreciative of the support that's provided by all our shareholders. So uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity um, post the AGM to, to thank everybody for their uh, support today and their ongoing support. Thank you.